now beginning to see uh, new combinations, meaning the combinations of a checkpoint inhibitor plus drug X have matured to the point where we actually we can see some data. And I think Paolo Ascerto from Naples had a pretty nice uh, poster, a poster discussion on LAG3 plus nivolumab. So Georgina, anything encouraging there? I mean, LAG3 yeah. preclinically seems very active, but again, that's in a mouse. How does it do in a patient? So first of all, LAG3 is a checkpoint on T cells. It's usually um, upregulated quite late in an exhausted T cell. That's the biology of it. And so in that study, they included uh, anti-PD-1 pa patients who'd progressed on anti-PD-1. They had two types. They had patients who had primary resistance, and they had a few patients who had acquired resistance. Now, I do want to point out that primary resistance is different clinically to acquired, possibly not biologically in terms of mechanism, but clinically it is different. Um, and what they saw is some responses in patients who had progressed on anti-PD-1 when they added LAG3 with an anti-PD-1. And what's more, what was really nice about the work is that they had a biomarker, which was LAG3 immunohistochemistry, and they saw that if there was higher expression of LAG3, uh, they got more responses in those um, patients. The interesting thing to me is in the acquired resistance patients, um, how did they measure response? Because often patients with acquired resistance will have responding lesions to anti-PD-1 and just one or two. So what were the target lesions? What were they measuring? Were they measuring the growing resistant as target lesions to report those responses? Nevertheless, by adding in LAG3, they got responses. So I think it's, it's early data, small numbers of patients, exciting um, in terms of Perhaps there may be other options. We do have to remember though, it's still focusing on the checkpoints on the T cells. And if you don't have the T cells in the tumor in the first place, we may have to come up with other ways of getting the immune response against the tumor. That's true. And they did find that LAG3 expression, I assume this was peripheral, peripheral blood, did seem to be associated with the modest number of patients who benefited. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was very, those are very interesting data. So let's, let's think about as we're getting toward the end, let's think about the future. Uh, I, I think at one count there were over 100 combination melanoma immunotherapy trials and there are 800 combination immunotherapy trials that you can find on uh, uh, cancer.gov uh, that patients can look up and try to get onto. So it's a huge burgeoning industry. So let's, let's start with you, uh, Robert, you tell me what do you think look like the most promising combinations? And usually it's a PD-1 backbone. I don't think IPI is as popular a drug. It's always the bad guy, but most of these are PD-1, PD-L1 in combination, or sometimes IPI plus NEVO plus drug X. But what do you think are the most promising combinations? So, so what I'm gonna do actually, Jeff, here, I know we'll have com you know, comments on you know, non interlesional therapy. So let me actually take that from the interlesional therapy perspective and, and give, okay. give my perspective on that, Jeff, if, if you don't mind. And I think that I actually, if we look at interlesional therapies in our preclinical models that we have in mice, often we find that it's the anti-CTLA-4 therapy, so the, that works better with the oncolytic immunotherapies, not necessarily the anti-PD-1. Now, whether that's because it's a mouse model, it may not be reflective in humans, we don't know. Having said that, we also have presented data here with the Coxsackie virus A21 in patients with, in combination with ipilimumab. And there we've seen some dramatic responses in patients with a large amount of disease burden, responses over 60% for this. So I think that we still should not discredit ipilimumab in this setting, that there are certain patients that may benefit from getting these oncolytic immunotherapies in combination with the ipilimumab. Having said that, we also presented data as well with the PD-1 inhibitor, where the response rate seems to be um, over 50% as well in this combination. Additionally, I think where we're moving with these oncolytic immunotherapies in some of them, that we're actually administering them intravenously, especially the viruses that have a receptor on the cell surface that, that allows them to gain access into the cell. So the Coxsackie virus, for instance, we have, are now giving that intravenously as well. And we are seeing some good responses with that, both as monotherapy, but also in combination therapy with the PD-1 inhibitors, specifically in lung cancer and bladder cancer, but also more recently we're doing it in melanoma. So I think that these oncolytic immunotherapies moving forward really ha will have several roles. First of all, it's monotherapy in patients with earlier disease, 
in combination therapy for patients that with more advanced disease when we try to get, get a better response. And I think thirdly, in patients that are then not responding to some of the current available checkpoint inhibitors to try to change the tumor microenvironment so we can then get a better response or re-response to those checkpoint inhibitors.